Today's scripture reading is taken from Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some in hundredfold, some sixty, some, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. This is the word of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to the Lord, Lord our God. You Amen. may be seated. When I was contemplating what I'd like to tell you about today's lesson about the sower and how Jesus had used this uh, metaphor to talk about spreading the word of God, I, I got to thinking back when I was a child. I, I grew up in South Kansas City. I th I've told some of you this already. And uh, I went to school in a little town called Grandview, which is now basically a suburb of Kansas City. And we lived out between Grandview and Raymore, if you know that part of South Kansas City. We were on some acreage. We weren't farmers. My dad just didn't want to live in the city anymore, and so we moved out there in the mid-50s. And so we lived on 10 acres, and about an acre of that we dedicated to our garden. And that's a lot of garden, if you can think of how much you could plant in one acre of land, but it was, a, it was a, the part that was designated a garden. I don't know why we didn't think we could plant half of it, but we decided this whole acre needed to be planted. And I thought about how we prepared for that each winter, that in January we'd get the seed catalog in the mail. Do you all remember getting seed catalogs? And maybe you still do, I don't know. But we, we would get a seed catalog and we'd start thinking about what seeds we wanted to plant that spring. And uh, there was always some new hybrids that came out or something that was that was a, and it grabbed our eye, you know, this, the, uh, the advertising and this plant would be the best tomatoes you ever had and the best green beans and the most uh, sweetest sweet corn and you know how all those advertisements go and we would select what we wanted to, to plant and order that sometime in the early spring or before spring got there actually. And I liked gardening in a way, there's things about it I didn't like, but, uh, but I was the, the, the fourth out of five and so I didn't do all the work early on and later I, I took over more of that as time went on. But, but I liked the idea of looking at a promising future, to think about this seed being a promise of new life and how a seed is kind of a mystery, right? Uh, we know what happens when a seed sprouts. We don't know what causes it to happen, right? We know that God has somehow programmed that into that, that, that plant, so that seed, so it knows what to do. And so we would go out to do that and when I was uh, much younger, we didn't have a rotor tiller. And so we'd plow it up and then we'd, we did a lot of hand work, and a lot of back breaking work to get the ground all, all really smooth and ready to plant. But, but after we got a rotor tiller, it was kind of fun to ride the rotor tiller. It was a, on the hook to the tractor and we'd ride along there and, and get the ground all ready. And then I enjoyed the part about putting out the stakes with the lines so we'd have really straight rows of whatever it is we were going to plant. And the idea of planting was fun, except I didn't like the ones that had the tiniest seeds that I couldn't even see hardly. You remember those, you like lettuces and it was it radishes are small too. Some of the other ones are really tiny. And that was my si older sister's job because they knew if I did it, they'd all end up in a spot about this big, uh, the whole packet of seeds. And there's supposed to be an entire row of whatever that plant was. And so the idea of laying it out and planting it and getting it all prepared and then waiting for rain, we didn't have the ability really or the desire to water it, so we'd have to wait for the rain to come. And so the rain usually did in the springtime, and so the, in a few days the, the seeds would sprout up and they'd get this tiny little green shoots and we'd try and remember if we didn't mark the rows, which we tried to remember to do, but if we didn't, we'd have to try and remember what is this thing that popped up here? And after a few times you would get to recognize what a sprout of of lettuce look like compared to corn or something like that. And so you have an idea of what it is. And darn it if those rabbits didn't come by and nip off as many of those as they could eat, right? I mean, you know that. And they would just invade the garden and sometimes we get 
uh, those box turtles come in there and all kinds of other things would eat the garden. That's the frustrating part. The other thing is that weeds grow even better than vegetables do, right? And so the weeds will grow up no matter whether it rains or not. And so weeding was not a whole lot of fun, especially as it got hotter and hotter. But you have to do it, right? If you don't keep the weeds out, they, the, the good plants get choked out and they can't really produce. They can't really produce like they're called to. And so gardening was a, was a challenge and a fun activity. But, but by about midsummer, when it was, you know, 90 degree with matching humidity, I really didn't want to be out there, and we'd get in clod, dirt clod fights with each other and, and all kinds of things like that. But the idea of gardening was fun in the beginning, and, the, and, and the, the, the reward was worth it, though, right? I mean, you can't beat fresh-grown green beans or peas or sweet corn or uh, okra. All, you can name all kinds of things. We didn't always grow a real wide variety, but we always had sweet corn, always had green beans and peas and turnips and things like that. And I enjoyed those vegetables because we would put our love and care into them. And when they came in, we'd sit out on the screen porch at night. We didn't have air conditioning, which a lot of people didn't at that point. And we'd sit out on the screen porch and, and uh, haul the peas or snap the beans or shuck the corn or whatever it is we were doing that day. And that was a good family time. I mean, it was a great memories of sitting there doing that. Well, this idea of, of planting seeds, and if some of you are probably farmers, some of you have planted a lot of seed over your time. And, and you know, there's this mystery about planting seeds, isn't there? Like I said before, you put it in the ground and you know what it takes to, to make them grow, but you don't really, you can't make it happen, right? You can only hope that God intervenes here and, and allows what you know will happen or to, really, to really come about. And so this idea of, of um, planting seeds is one that Jesus uses in this analogy or this metaphor about spreading the word of God, right? He says, that if the sower went out to spread the seed and the seed landed in, uh, on a hard path, that, and I know this from planting seeds, if you didn't till that soil and it was all packed down, that seed's not going to do anything, right, until the bird comes and eats it and it's just gone, <laughs> right? And so you have to plant it in soil that's been prepared, that's been tilled and, and ready. So if you plant it on, if you just throw it out on the path, it, it's just, it's a loss. It's a waste. And my dad was big on not wasting anything. So we didn't drop the seed and, without getting in trouble. And said, so then he said, if you plant it in the, if, you, if it gets on the rocky soil, that, and we didn't have rocks in our garden, thank goodness. But I've seen a lot of people try and garden in, in places where it was more rocks than it was dirt especially back in Connecticut where Anne's from, her family's from there. And it seemed like they, they grow rocks back there. I don't know why, but uh, new rocks would pop up in the, in the field. Every, every year there'd be more rocks in the field than there were the year before. And that's why they had these rock, uh, look like rock walls, but they were just piles of rock from the field that had been gathered up each year in order to plant that. And so if, if you plant a seed in a real rocky area and the soil is real thin, then what Jesus said, you know, the, 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 the plant will spring up, but it can't develop roots because there's nowhere for the roots to go, right? There's nowhere for them to really go to get nutrients. And so the plant, when the hot sun comes out, it withers and dies. And you've seen that, right? You've seen soil that wasn't properly prepared or had too much rock or didn't have enough topsoil in there. And then he said, if you, if you plant the seeds among the thorny weeds, the weeds will choke it out. They'll take all the nutrients and they won't allow the vegetable to grow. And so this metaphor about, about planting, Jesus used a lot of agricultural metaphors because the people knew this. They knew about planting seeds. They knew about how to raise, how to raise crops. But then Jesus goes on later. We didn't include this in the reading today because he goes back later to explain what this means. And let me read this word for word so you hear it um, right from the scripture because that's, I might leave out a detail I wouldn't want to leave out. Jesus explains this when he says, this is Matthew 13, starting with verse 18. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the kingdom of God, hears of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was the seed representing the seed that was falling on the hard path. If they hear the word of God, they can easily, it can easily be snatched away as the birds would come and eat up the seed. And what this is referring to, that, that if you try and share the good news of Jesus Christ with someone that's not properly prepared, that really doesn't, 
They're, they aren't receptive to this yet. If you just walk up to, th to someone and say, hey, do you know Jesus? And you have no relationship with them, what are they going to do? They're going to turn and run the other way. They're going to say, some crazy person is trying to talk to me. Thanks probably happened to all of us at one time or another. And so if you're not prepared, it's not a good time to share the gospel. You need to, you need to develop a relationship with them. You need to till the soil, so to speak. You need to get them ready to plant this seed of good news with them. It's like the hardened heart. It's, it's just not open. It's not receptive to hear what it is you have to say. So Jesus goes on. He says, as for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word of God and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And then when, and when trouble or persecution arises on account of the world, that person immediately falls away. So we're talking about someone who uh, it gets really excited about hearing the word of God. And, and many times you see people go through conversion experiences where they said, I accept Jesus as my Savior, and, 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 and they are on fire for a week or two. You know, I'm, I, it, this, is, this is not condemning that at all, but it's just like if there's no follow-up, if there's no nurturing by others, we call this sanctification in the, in the Methodist tradition. We call it, you know, if you go through that point of, of justification, the point of understanding that your sins are forgiven through Jesus Christ, but you don't have people there to help you in that journey, to make it to the next step and to really develop through this process of sanctification where you allow more and more of God within you and, and, and exhibit more of those qualities to others, then, then it's like the rocky soil, right? You, 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 you are immediately a Christian, but then what you do from there on is the problem when the roots don't really get enough nutrients. Then you need, we need to feed those people. We need to nurture them and encourage them and help them to see a better way to live. This is an important part of what it means to, uh, to help someone become a Christian because we can't make it happen, right? This is something God does, but we can be a part of the process. And so new Christians sometimes fall away because they don't get the support that they need. And then Jesus goes on to say, As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke out the word and it yields nothing. If you've decided that you want to be a follower of Jesus, but you're still mostly focused on your bank account, or you're mostly focused on your job, or you're mostly focused on your recreation, or whatever it is that's the primary focus in your life, if that becomes central and you're not tending to this new relationship you have, then you're allowing the weeds to take over. The weeds of life can choke out the spirit within you. And so this is a something we have to be careful if if you become a new believer but you still live among the weeds you've got a problem you've got to find new friends you've got to find new com companions new people to run with and and i'm not saying you don't witness to the friends that you're with and that you don't abandon them but you've got to have a group of people like a small group that you go to that helps you to build your life your new life with new friends and new surroundings and this is something that i think we miss oftentimes with new believers, we, we, we welcome people and we tell them about the good news and sometimes they accept it. But, but if they don't change, you know, it's talk about your, your, your playmates and your play, playgrounds. If you don't change those things, then life can be very hard to maintain as a new, as a new Christian. And then Jesus goes on and says, For what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold and another 16 and another 30. This idea of the, the seed that gets all the right attention, like when I was talking about gardening, if we'd really tilled that soil well and, and it had been fertilized or it, we'd been tending it in such a way we've kept the weeds out and we didn't, keep, we didn't let the rocks uh, be a hindrance to its growing, that's where you get the best crop, right? And, and I was always surprised sometimes by late summer, I wish the beans we couldn't make in beans. You know what I'm saying? not really the thing. That's where the analogy breaks down, right? Because we never, get, we never get tired of making new disciples. But this idea of tending it is, is important, this idea of keeping it going. And I thought about this, th what it really takes to prepare people's hearts and minds to be a believer in Jesus Christ. And you know the thing that's probably the secular word that helps us the most is that develop a good relationship with them. You must be friends with them first before you can share what you believe. 
And many people get this backwards. Many people are so on fire to witness that they forget the fact that if this person doesn't know them, they're not likely to listen to them. I, uh, I often use this, uh, this, this phrase that no one really cares what you know until they know that you, what? Care. Right, they don't really know, they don't really care what you know until they're really convinced that you care about them. You need to care about them. This is something that I did a lot when I, I've, I've shared with you a little bit. I spent over 20 years in sales and in sales management. And one of the things about sales is that it's not about how, how much you can pressure someone into buying something. You know, that's the, the quote, the used car salesman, uh, and the, I'm not disrespecting used car salesmen, but that's the, uh, that's the image that comes in mind. You know, like you're trying to force someone to do something. You're trying to trick them into doing it like, well, what, what does it take to close this deal today, you know, and, and you've pushed them to that decision. And, you know, they, when I was selling to, to uh, I sold to mostly manufacturers and people like that. And, and I, first of all, you don't try and sell them something they don't need, right? It has to be something that they need. Well, we know that people need the Word of God. We know they need the grace that can only come through Jesus Christ. This is something we know they need. They may not know it themselves, but we know they need it. And so we need to develop this relationship with them. And, and we need to get them to the point that they trust us. And like I was using a sales analogy, if I was trying to sell something to somebody, if they didn't believe that I was telling them the truth, there's no use in me trying to close a sale. Right? I mean, if any of you have done any sales, you know what I'm saying. Because you might actually get the first order so they get you out of their office. Sometimes people will give you an order just to get rid of you because you're the biggest pest they've seen all day. But I also go into offices, I've gone into a lot of uh, buyer's offices where the sign says, you know, we shoot every third salesman and the second one just left. <laughs> and so then I go, oh, okay. <clears throat> I'm here to check on the uh, refrigerators. I don't know, you know, you change your tune really fast with that one. But, but this idea that you can't convince somebody of something unless they know that you're not lying to them. And, and see, that's, that's the bad rap that sometimes both evangelists and salesmen get, is that we're telling you something that we don't even believe ourselves. But you've got to live your life in a way that people catch on the relationship with you. Then you have an opportunity to share why you have this joy in your life. Because if you don't get the relationship fir first, they just think you're a crazy person, right? I mean, that's just the way that is sometimes. They say, well, you're so joyful, there must be something wrong. He said, no, it's not wrong, it's all right. And so this idea of planting seeds in the right place, at the right time, with the right preparation, this is essential for being a witness for Jesus Christ. And we don't use the word evangelism much in Methodism just because people get, the, they call it the E word, you know. Let's not talk about evangelism because that's really hard. It's not hard at all if you develop a relationship with them. If they know you and love you and care for you and you care for them and they know it, they're going to listen to what you have to say. And they're going to be interested in hearing about the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's our job. One of the best ways to be a witnessing Christian is through your life. Is the way you live your life. The way you show love and grace to others. If they see that in you, they want to be like you. And it's not really like being like you. It's like being like Jesus, right? You're trying to imitate Jesus so they can get on, the board, get on board with you. And live a life that's full and complete. John and Charles Wesley that started the Methodist movement, and, they, and I emph always emphasize that because they didn't try and start a church. It became a church, but they started a movement. But one of the things that they, uh, they said is we need a, a faith that's practical, that people can actually use, not just some uh, you know, ethereal thing that's in your brain and you, you don't know how to apply it. But they said the way, you, the way you apply this is the way you treat other people. The way you show love to God is showing love to others. By showing love to others, you show that you love God. You prove that you love God. And uh, Wesley came up with uh, three, what is sometimes called three simple rules. It, uh, he used a term like more general rules, three general rules. But the first one is do no harm. And we can understand that, right? Do nothing that would cause harm to another person. This is a paramount thing. This is like the golden rule, right? Treat others the way you want to be treated. So you do no harm. The second one is do good. Do as much good as you can. Help others. Help them to see your generosity and your love and your grace. You know, you know a neighbor that's struggling, and instead of saying, hey, can I come mow your lawn? Just show up and mow their lawn. 
or you, you know, if they, if they want, if they need something like, you know that they're having a hard time cooking because they're like the primary caregivers taking care of another person. And you know they may have trouble uh, getting, getting the things done, like go to the grocery store and stuff. Just say, hey, I brought in a few groceries for you. They made it made something that you like and, and uh, s some paper products and things like that. You just do it. You know what I'm saying? Because then it's not like you're not asking their permission to do it. You're saying, let me show you some grace and some love. And this is one of the best ways to do it, is to show, do as much good as you can for others. And the third one is stay in love with God. If you stay in love with God, then you're more likely to do what God asks us to do. This idea of, of serving others and loving others and offering grace to others the same way we've received grace, to forgive others the way we've been forgiven, this is what it means to be a Christian, to really live out your life in, a, in, a, in an outward way that people really know that you're a different person. You're not the same person that you were before you knew Christ and that you're, you're, you don't act differently in front of them than you do other people, that you show all, all people this kind of love and grace. And that's what I think Jesus was teaching us when he says about planting those seeds is make sure you've got the soil tilled and you've got the rocks out of the way and you've, you've taken out the weeds and all the things that would prevent someone from growing into being a fruitful Christian. Help them to see a way there that is not hindered by these stresses of life. Help them to find new groups to be a part of, new friends to find. Help them to, to experience the water of salvation through Jesus. This is what I think it's, we're called to be as farmers for Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.